Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome. Welcome back. Welcome for the first time. You are here for the Sustainability Laboratories 12th installment. Um, it's our 12th session of conversations with some of the leading global systems thinkers working at the leading edge of sustainability. Um, we've been hosting these conversations over the last um, year and a half. And with that, I am just delighted to have the real privilege of introducing tonight our our guest, Thomas Greco, um, for a conversation on alternative currencies and solar dollars. Uh, Thomas is a pre preeminent scholar, author, educator, and community economist who for more than 35 years has been working at the leading edge of transformational structuring. He's widely regarded as a leading authority on moneyless exchange systems, community currencies, financial innovation, and community economic development. Uh, we will be sharing the link to his website um, in the chat. It is an unbelievable resource for all of the ideas that you're going to be um, hearing about today. I cannot recommend more highly checking it out at the, after tonight's session. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Michael Benelli, who is the founder of the Sustainability Laboratory and the host of tonight's conversation. Wonderful introduction. Hello, Tom. It's really wonderful to have you with us. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome, Th and thank you for uh, joining us tonight. At the outset, I want to uh, apologize for my voice and for being perhaps a little foggy. I just tested uh, positive, but the show has to go on. So let's start with Tom. Tom, why don't you introduce yourself uh, to our audience a little bit? Well, thank you, Michael. First of all, I want to express my sincere thanks to you, Michael, and and Liz and Nicole and all the team at Sustainable Sustainability Lab for giving me this opportunity to share what I've learned over the last 40 years or so about the money problem and about the state of our civilization, which is clearly in decline. So with that, uh, Basically, my educational background started, uh, well, at uh, Villanova University, where I got an en engineering degree, bachelor's degree, and uh, worked for five years in the aerospace industry, and then went to graduate school at the University of Rochester, where I got uh, an MBA, and then uh, I've done some graduate school work at Syracuse University pursuant to a PhD in management. So uh, I'll say more about that uh, as we go on. Uh, in 1979, well, after, after uh, finishing my MBA, I, I took a job as an academic with Rochester Institute of Technology. And I taught there for 14 years and uh, when I received tenure in uh, 1972, uh, I requested a sabbatical leave to go work on my PhD, which was granted. So uh, I spent the academic year 73 and 74 at Syracuse uh, doing that. And my main course of study was statistics and decision sciences with uh, minor fields in instructional technology and organizational behavior. Uh, in 1979, I resigned my tenured position at RIT in order to follow the beat of a different drum, if you will. And since then I've been working as a independent scholar, consultant, and uh, advisor to various uh, currency projects uh, around the world. I've uh, I've been to I think probably 35 or 40 different countries on five continents, uh, giving presentations and doing workshops. We'd like to uh, know much more about the uh, making 
of Thomas Greco. So perhaps on a more personal note, uh, tell us about growing up, you know, what made you choose your field, major milestones or steps in development, major inspirations, key events, mentors, things like that. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I, I was born and raised in Rochester, New York, and I grew up in an Italian-American family and neighborhood, went to Catholic schools, Catholic grade school, Catholic high school. Um, I grew up in the 40s and 50s. So, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've been privileged to live a pretty long life so far. And uh, I grew up in the era of World War II. I, I even remember when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. I, I was only five years old at the time, but I was at home. My mother was a housewife, and uh, she was visibly upset when the news of the bombing came uh, on the radio. And so that stuck in my memory even to this day. And uh, as I got older, you know, I was in grade school. Uh, I was nine years old when the war ended. But, uh, you know, I understood enough about what was going on uh, to be concerned about why people were engaged in such destruction and, and carnage. And, uh, of course, that was all reinforced by a lot of the government propaganda movies that were uh, produced at that time to keep uh, morale up and to keep support for the war. Uh, as well. And uh, so, and my father was eventually drafted into the army. He was on the uh, old side and he had uh, a wife and two kids at the time. So he was one of the last to be drafted in the fall of 1944. So, you know, the, uh, the experience, even though it was quite a, a safe experience for, for me personally, uh, you know, hearing about it and having all this information about it really sensitized me to uh, the issue of peace. And later on, I got involved in other things uh, with uh, justice as well. So uh, anyway, I, uh, I've had this sense that uh, something was wrong from a very young age, and uh, I didn't really realize how wrong things are until later on in my life. You know, as I went through uh, graduate school, uh, I met my wife and we married uh, toward the end of my MBA degree. And we had two sons and uh, I was uh, starting my academic career at RIT. So as I said, midway between uh, my start of my academic career and my ending of it in 1979, I went on sabbatical leave to Syracuse to work on my PhD. Well, while I was at Syracuse, I had uh, what you might call a, oh, um, a life-changing experience, an epiphany, if you will. And uh, it's hard to describe the circumstances around that, but it was like uh, I was waking up to a new reality. If you've ever seen the film The Matrix, it was sort of like that. You know, I realized that I had been in the Matrix for all my life until that point, and it caused me to question everything that I thought I knew. So I embarked upon a personal program of re-education, uh, looking into a wide variety of fields. You know, I've been pretty much uh, stuck in the technology, science, and math realm uh, up until that point. And uh, I started looking more deeply at social sciences, including economics and monetary theory and uh, sociology, human behavior. I realized that I didn't even understand what was motivating my own behavior. And so uh, I got involved in a lot of different personal growth modalities. From there, I got involved in various movements like the human potential movement, the bioregional movement, um, the alternative money movement. For, for many years, you pioneered ideas on alternative currencies as an essential step towards a 
sustainable economy in a better world. Uh, you've been critical of the political money and banking. What is wrong with our money system? Well, mainly the problem with the political money system is it misallocates money. The money goes not where it's most needed or deserved. It exploits productive enterprise through bank charges like interest and fees and foreclosures. It's manipulated for the benefit of the controllers of the money, uh, which has created a power elite of a wealthy super class that controls both politics, economics, finance, and uh, across the board. It undermines democratic government, and it creates inequities and social conflict. Uh, there is in the money system uh, a growth imperative. I'll get into the details of this later on, but to sum it up, we have a growth imperative that's built into the economy because the way money is created by making loans, uh, you have a compound interest that causes debt to increase just with the passage of time. And so we end up with a situation where you have entities in the economy competing with one another to avoid defaulting on their debts. And not everyone, not every entity can pay what they owe because of the way money is created by creating debt. So I, I have a slideshow that will help to elaborate on this. And here's a quote from the Bank of England. It says, whenever a bank makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. Now, just think about that for a minute. A bank makes a loan, it creates a deposit, which is money, and thereby new money is created. The Bank of Canada says the same thing. Each and every time a bank makes a loan, new bank credit money is created. So here's a pictorial diagram that uh, will illustrate that. You've got a bank. Let's say you go to this bank and you say, uh, I need a loan, I wanna buy a house. Uh, the bank looks at your credit rating and your income and they say, okay, sign this mortgage note. That's an asset on their books. And they make a deposit to your account, which is a liability on their books. So in double entry bookkeeping, you've got assets matching liabilities, and this is the way money is created. Now, John Kenneth Galbraith, who was the foremost economist in the 20th century, said, the way in which money is created is so simple that the mind is repelled. And that's the sum of it. Now, when you consider that interest is charged on these loans, there's never enough money in circulation to allow all the loans to be paid. Somebody has to come up short. Now you've heard about quantitative easing. Quantitative easing was actually the central bank buying up government debt. Now, first of all, government has become the borrower of last resort, as I put it, in order to make up the shortfall when there isn't enough debt in the private sector to keep the money supply pumped up. So the outcomes of this system are partly uh, greater and greater disparities of income and wealth. And this chart shows how that has progressed uh, over the last many years. Uh, the top percentiles reaping the benefits of most of the productivity gains that we've experienced in our economy over the, set, uh, over the past century or so. Now let me go back here. Uh, this also shows the disparities in wealth and the increasing power of this elite group in the top echelon. And this is a truly astonishing chart. This shows the growth of U.S. government debt from 1900 to 1920. And you can see it barely registers even in 1940, it just 
started to show on this scale uh, during World War II. But even the enormous debts that were encountered during World War II are minuscule in relation to what has happened since then. Now, this bar graph only goes to 2020. And at that time, the US government debt had grown to $23 trillion. I don't have an up-to-date chart, but I do have up-to-date figures from just a few days ago. The total government debt now stands at $31.6 trillion, or 120.4% of gross domestic product, which is a measure of total economic activity. That's almost $95,000 for each man, woman, and child in the United States. So when you look back at this chart, it goes way off. If we were to chart the, the latest figures, uh, we wouldn't have room. So when I say the government has become the borrower of last resort, that's what I mean. They've had to step in and practice what was called Keynesian economics. You know, Keynes prescribed a way out of the Great Depression. He said the government has to step in and pump up the money supply. And the way to do that would be to borrow money into circulation. He didn't realize it was a one-way street, that once that was started on Han, it would never end. So in sum, what's wrong with the money system? First of all, we have this pervasive and false belief that the money power must be centralized in the hands of the state. And one of the chapters in my latest book, The End of Money and the Future of Civilization, calls for the separation of money and state. Now, this is a false myth that government has the monetary authority. Bankers and politicians joined forces long ago to increase their own power and wealth. And in other presentations, I talk about the founding of the Bank of England in 1694, which was the beginning of the central banking system that has spread around the world in every country that now has a central bank. So the interest, actually usury, that's built into the money creation process creates this artificial deficiency of money that is available to repay the inevitably increasing amounts of debt. And the economic and political control become ever more centralized in the hands of the few, and democratic government is corrupted until we hardly have any democracy left. Here's a famous quote by John Maynard Keynes, whom I mentioned earlier. He said, by a continuous process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. So what looks like government debt is not really a debt. It's just the amount of value that's been appropriated by the government that's never going to be repaid. And he says, by this method, they not only confiscate, but also confiscate arbitrarily. And while the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some, which is the elite class. The process engages all of the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction, including the destructiveness of war. It does it in a manner that not one man in a million can diagnose. Along with that, we've had the rise of corporate power. This quote from Franklin Roosevelt, former president. The first truth is that the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than their democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism. Ownership of government by an individual, by a group, or by any other controlling private power. Uh, Andrew Jackson said pretty much the same thing back in uh, 1832. So the features of political money that make them dom dominant, despite these dysfunctional aspects and uh, destructive nature, are that they're widely accepted. You know, this is... Uh, a well-developed uh, global infrastructure 
that enables me to go to any foreign country and uh, put my debit card into a slot in the wall and draw out British pounds or, or euros or Malaysian ringgit or some other currency that I need in the country that I happen to be visiting. So these currencies are usually exchanged for one another. Uh, they all suffer from the same defects. It's a matter of uh, which are worse than the others. Um, these currencies are recognized by governments and supported by governments that impose legal tender laws and restrict competition. Of course, there's the inertia. We're all habituated to using these currencies. Uh, the true costs and destructive side effects are unrecognized and obscured. But mostly, people have a general lack of knowledge that sound and effective exchange alternatives exist. And this is what I've been trying to remedy in my work uh, over the last uh, 40 or so years. So this political money regime needs to be transcended. Now put yourself in the place of uh, the elite group. Can you imagine having total control over the creation of money? That you can create as much of it as you want? That you can give it or lend it to whomever you want? That you can spend it in any way you want? for any purpose, that you can make people pay to get it and to use it. That's the interest that's built into the process. That you can take people's property when they are unable to pay, as, a, as many of them are inevitably uh, unable to pay. This is through foreclosure. And very shortly, you will be able to approve or deny anyone's purchase. This is on the agenda. And you can freeze anyone's savings or checking account if you disapprove of what they are doing or if they're too critical of government actions and corporate uh, activities. Let's go on from, from this and uh, to the, the whole idea of exchange value. Uh, what are alternative currencies to those in the audience who are not familiar with the term? Uh, why alternative currencies? And can you describe a few uh, case experiences as good models? Yes. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll continue with that. Uh, we need to look at how we exchange value in an economy. Uh, first of all, transfer of value can be without obligation through gift exchange. You know, you give me something without any expectation of return. Uh, transfer can be coerced through theft or robbery or extortion uh, or most taxes. You don't have a choice, uh, really. I mean, you do, but uh, the, the cost of refusal is onerous. But by and large, uh, we transfer value through reciprocal exchange. With, where This is a, a voluntary exchange where we expect to give as much as we get and get as much as we give. So this is why money was invented. And we have political fiat money, which we're all using every day, and we're quite familiar with that. But we also have innovative approaches to exchange, which are private currencies and direct credit clearing amongst uh, buyers and sellers. So I will get into a description of all of these as we go along. What's a private currency? A private currency is a currency that's issued by some productive enterprise. If we look at how money has evolved, we can see that at first we had commodity money. Many things served as commodities uh, of exchange, like, uh, oh, in the uh, American colonies, furs, bullets, nails. Uh, salt. Throughout history, we had other commodities. Uh, typically, economies uh, would settle on the precious metals as the most convenient commodities to use as money. And then we had symbolic money. People would deposit their gold or silver in the bank. Banks would issue banknotes. 
and they would uh, promise to redeem the banknotes in gold or silver on demand. Of course, they never had enough uh, uh, gold or silver to uh, redeem all the banknotes, and this became known as the fractional reserve banking system. And eventually, uh, we went to a pure credit money system. Uh, the last link with gold and silver was broken when President Nixon said, we will no longer exchange dollars for gold. That was in 1971. But credit has always been a part of the monetary system, even when commodity money was defining the value of money. So now we're looking at a future where private currencies and direct credit clearing are making money obsolete, and that's on the horizon. So when we consider what is money, money is simply a, a promise of an issuer to redeem it for something of value. Now, when you think about uh, the political monies that we've been talking about, what do they promise to redeem it in? There is no promise of redemption anymore uh, in anything of value. If you take uh, your $10 bill to the bank and say, well, you can give me 10 ones or two fives, or you can put it uh, into your checking account or savings account. So it just changes form, but it's the same thing. And there's no promise of redemption uh, of any kind of value. So the proper basis of issue for any currency is the goods or services that the providers are ready, willing, and able to deliver immediately or in the near future. Government doesn't do that. Central banks don't do that. Only providers of real goods and services are qualified to do that. We also have the reciprocal exchange process through direct credit clearing when buyers and sellers uh, form an association and transact business amongst themselves without using money at all. Both of these provide reliable sources of credit and supplemental payment media based on real value that is locally created. So this is superior kind of money because it promises something real, goods or services that are in general demand. So I illustrate it this way. In this diagram, we've got a trusted producer, and this could be any business that produces goods or services of uh, general demand. You've got over on the left, employees, suppliers, and contractors. And over here, I've shown the community in general, composed of merchants, professionals, and all kinds of businesses and individuals. So we start the process when the trusted producer issues his own currency vouchers. Instead of paying these people with conventional political money, he offers them his own currency vouchers in return for their labor services and supplies. So what do these people do with these currency vouchers? Well, they can offer them to these people in the community in return for whatever it is they want. Mm -hmm. And those uh, individuals can circulate them amongst themselves any number of times before they eventually redeem them for what the trusted producer has agreed to provide. So this is the reciprocity circuit. You have the currency going in one direction and real value going in the other direction. So these are private currency vouchers that can circulate throughout the community until someone uses them to repay mm -hmm. or to pay the issuer, and then they're retired. Of course, they can be reissued so long as the issuer has sufficient basis or foundation in terms of real goods and services to support them. Now, there are plenty of examples throughout history. Uh, the Great Depression was uh, an opportunity for private and community currencies uh, to emerge in a large way. Uh, the problem in the Great Depression was there wasn't enough conventional money in circulation. 
uh, the Keynesian prescription hadn't yet been implemented. And so private entities like the Larkin Company offered their own currency vouchers as payment, as I illustrated in the previous slide, to their employees and suppliers. And uh, the Larkin Company was a merchandising company. It has several branches throughout the Western New York State area. And uh, so these vouchers circulated successfully as currency and then were accepted back by the Larkin Company in return for anything that the, the bearer wanted to buy from them. Uh, Canadian Tire Company is a, an example of a rebate currency. These have been in circulation since 1958 in one form or another. And uh, the Canadian Tire Company, like the Larkin Company, has a number of retail establishments. They sell a lot more than just tires. And uh, when you go to a Canadian Tire outlet and you make a purchase, they will give you a small rebate, maybe two, three percent of your purchase uh, back in Canadian Tire money. And these two have circulated uh, outside of uh, the Canadian Tire Company before they were redeemed back for purchase at the company. In uh, the mid-1990s and early 2000s, there were uh, a number of community currencies that sprung up in Argentina because Argentina was in a similar situation to the Great Depression where there wasn't enough peso government currency in circulation. So a lot of these trading clubs or treque clubs sprung up and they each issued their own currency. So these are just a few of the club currencies that were issued. And uh, they made an abortive attempt to network together, but uh, they did it in a way that really wasn't successful. So we've learned a lot from all of these experiences. Tom, you, you've been championing the idea of solar dollars. I find this idea particularly exciting because it ties the idea of alternative currencies with a way to basically stimulate the use of alternative uh, energy. Uh, so can you share your ideas about solar dollars with us? Yeah, the solar dollar currency project is uh, an initiative that I started promoting about uh, five or six years ago. And uh, I was trying to do two things at once. Not only was I trying to create an alternative medium of exchange, but also I thought, well, we can piggyback that onto an attempt to promote renewable energy production and usage. So here's a special case of the diagram that I just showed. Uh, in this case, we've got an electric utility company as the trusted issuer, and uh, they issue solar dollars in the same way that we saw previously to employers, suppliers, employees, suppliers, and contractors uh, in return for their labor services and supplies. And again, uh, those solar dollars would be offered to the merchants in the community, and they would circulate throughout the community for some period of time until they were redeemed back uh, to the electric utility company uh, by someone who wanted to pay their electric bill. So the solar dollars can circulate throughout the community until someone uses them to pay their electric bill. Now, since most everybody has an electric bill, uh, these solar dollars would be in quite uh, high demand and readily accepted by almost anyone. So even if uh, someone here didn't have an electric bill to pay themselves, they could pass it on by buying something from someone who does have an electric bill and could use it and redeem it for uh, electric power services. So the advantages uh, of this program would be the creation of a supplemental exchange medium in the community, which would promote uh, greater self-reliance and uh, resilience of the community economy 
and at the same time, promote the shift to renewable energy. Now, there would be a third uh, entity involved here, uh, a nonprofit organization that would authorize the utility company uh, to issue solar dollars by auditing the amount of renewable energy that they were producing or buying and able to sell to their customers. So if the electric utility company uh, was selling, let's say, a uh, million dollars worth of renewable energy per month, uh, they might be allowed to issue two months or two million dollars uh, in solar dollars. If they were selling, uh, let's say, five million dollars a month of renewable energy, they would be allowed to issue uh, 10 mm -hmm. million solar dollars into circulation. So that's basically the, the solar dollar program. Now, th these ideas are, are, are really super compelling. So why, why hasn't the implementation of alternative currencies been more widespread? Why haven't community currencies been more successful? Well, over the last uh, oh, 30 years or so, we've had uh, community currencies, local currencies popping up all over the world. Uh, I think uh, many have come and gone. And we have some notable examples. In the UK, there's been the Bristol pound and the Brixton pound. In Canada, uh, the Toronto dollars and Salt Spring Island dollars. Uh, in the United States, even we have one called the Berkshires that's uh, issued by the Schumacher Society in Massachusetts. Uh, by and large, they follow the same model. They're all sold into circulation, not spent into circulation the way I described earlier. So basically, uh, you have to have fiat money in order to bring them into circulation. So they don't really provide any additional liquidity. They don't provide any additional new means of payment for the community. They simply act as a, a gift certificate with limited circul circulation. Now we're all, we're all familiar with gift certificates or gift cards uh, where you pay cash to get them and uh, they're not redeemable back into cash, uh, but then you can spend them at the merchant's and get what you want. Uh, another problem with these currencies is uh, they did allow them to be redeemed for cash, although at a discount. So they didn't really circulate very much before they were turned back into cash. Uh, the costs are high in comparison to their benefits. They're not self-sustaining. They depend on grant funding. Uh, this is particularly true of the Bristol pound. I don't know how, how many tens of thousands of dollars they've gone through to sustain this uh, currency, or they depend on merchant discounts or collectors who take them as souvenirs and never redeem them. That's particularly true with the Salt Spring Island dollars in Canada. I think they estimate that about 30 or 40% of these uh, Salt Spring Island dollars were taken by collectors and never redeemed. You, you mentioned earlier uh, basically two alternatives to fiat money, the, the private and community money and mutual credit clearing. Uh, perhaps it's a good time now to speak a little bit more about the mutual credit creation. Okay, yeah, I've got that in, in the next slide here. All right, let's suppose, uh, let's suppose we're all in business of some sort. Um, some of us uh, are professionals that provide a service of some kind. Many of us uh, run restaurants or eateries of some kind. Uh, some of us uh, sell hard goods like computers or computer equipment, stationary supplies or whatever. So we form an association represented by this oval. And uh, I make a distinction between two types of members issuing members and non-issuing members. 
So the difference is that the issuing members, they have something that is in general demand, like computer equipment, stationary supplies, uh, auto repair work, things of that sort. The non-issuing members are people that have less demand for their services. Maybe they're people that are retired uh, who teach guitar lessons on the side and things like that. So the process begins with the issuing member. They have the option of buying before they spend. That means that their account will go negative before it returns to the positive. So they buy something by issuing credits that have been pre-authorized. And then that person buys something from someone else. And that person passes those credits on to get something from someone else and so on and so forth. And eventually the original issuer has to redeem his uh, credit currency mm -hmm. and bring his balance back toward the positive. He doesn't necessarily have to go positive. Sometimes the account balances will be negative, sometimes positive. But the whole point is to make it possible for us to exchange value among ourselves without using conventional money. And uh, this is nothing new. This was done back in the 1930s, again, during the Great Depression. In Switzerland, uh, the small and medium-sized businesses were having a hard time uh, surviving because there wasn't enough Swiss francs in circulation. So they came together to figure out a way that they could continue to do business with one another, at least, uh, without having to use political money. And they came up with this credit clearing system. So it was called the Swiss Veer Business Circle Cooperatives. Now, Veer in German means we. So it also stands for an acronym, which I won't try to pronounce. And uh, so it was established in 1934, and it was operated as a credit clearing exchange purely until the mid-1990s. And then they got a conventional bank charter they're doing a conventional bank business now, but they're continuing to do the credit clearing process amongst about 60,000 business members, and they clear about $2 billion worth of trades annually. In addition to that, we've had over the last 40 or 50 years, a lot of commercial trade exchanges or barter exchanges spring up around the world. And there are today uh, scores of trade exchanges that operate in different countries around the world. These are just a few logos. Uh, Sardex is one that operates in Sardinia in Italy. ITEX is a US-based company. Uh, trade Source is in Phoenix. Uh, IMS is a, a, a network of uh, trade exchanges in the US. BarterCard is an international group, and uh, they have... Uh, they have uh, exchange, trade exchanges in different countries around the world. So this is nothing new and it's going on today. And uh, these commercial trade exchanges are collectively doing about $20, $20 billion billion worth of uh, credit clearing annually. So looking across all of these, it seems that one important critical question is what makes for a sound credit system. Okay, let's enumerate those points. A sound credit system, whether it's a community currency, a private currency, a, to a local currency, or a credit issued within a credit clearing association, you have to have a proper basis of issue. That means goods or services that are in regular demand, that are available now or in the near future. So the amount that you have available to redeem the credit must not be excessive in, in relation to the foundation. Now there's a rule of thumb that comes from conventional banking going back a long ways. Uh, two or three months 
sales is about the maximum credit that ought to be uh, used as the basis for a credit money system. There should be no favoritism in allocating credit lines. The allocation of credit lines to the various participants in a credit clearing exchange uh, should be according to uh, an objective algorithm that is established ahead of time, where you take account not only of the foundation, uh, the value of the goods and services available for redemption of the currency, but also your overall solvency, your credit rating. Uh, you don't want to uh, allocate a large credit line to a business that is at risk of going bankrupt. And uh, so various other things might go into the algorithm. And uh, we can talk about that later if you like. There should be no difference in price between fiat sales and trade credit sales. Uh, this is an important point that uh, in order for the credit money to maintain its value in the market, uh, merchants should not say you have to pay a higher price in trade credit than mm. they would charge in cash. And uh, today, commercial trade exchanges are almost all proprietary for-profit businesses, but in the future, I see them becoming more and more cooperative and communal in which the users control the organization and government governance. Uh, also in the future, we're gonna to need to network these local credit clearing exchanges together uh, in a way that makes it possible for us to use our local credit globally rather than just locally. Now, this is all very fascinating. Uh, how, how do you see the, the, all of this developing? Uh, where does it all go from where we are today? I see that we're going to have uh, local exchange systems uh, expanding worldwide. We have to, first of all, realize that we have the power to take control of our exchange process. We don't have to continue to be dominated by the political money system. We have to realize that every producer that has goods or services that are useful and desired is qualified to issue a currency. Mm. And a currency may be issued individually or jointly by a group of producers. You know, individually would be a private producer issuing their own uh, currency vouchers. A group of producers would be a credit clearing circle or a group of producers issuing under a shared brand. And that's been done before as well. So these currencies would be in the form of trade credits that are readily available, fully backed by real value, and an important point, interest-free, unlike conventional money. Now, why interest-free? Well, interest-free because we want to avoid the, the, uh, the growth imperative, the debt growth imperative and the economic growth imperative. And we can do it because businesses already give each other credit uh, without interest. So who's qualified to issue? We can have municipal governments issuing tax anticipation notes or issuing their own currency on the basis of fees that they charge for services like building permit fees and the such. Uh, businesses can issue currencies on the basis of their capacity to provide goods and services, as we said, and associations of businesses and local governments based on a cooperative agreement to jointly issue a currency based on their combined productive yep. capacity. So the future of independent exchange if a community currency and credit movement is to become significant, it must, first of all, provide independent interest-free liquidity to local enterprises. And that's something I've been trying to promote here in Tucson and elsewhere. Through networks of federated local exchange circles that subscribe to a set of standard protocols 
that assure the soundness and stability of each member circle and its currency credits. So when I talk about networking globally, uh, these are the things that have, have to happen in order for that to be possible. Uh, if we start federating, let's say, uh, a credit clearing network in Tucson with similar networks in San Francisco and New York and uh, London and elsewhere, we're going to have to have uh, some standard protocols and procedures uh, to enable those networks to function, just as we had to have those standard procedures and protocols uh, to allow us to network our personal computers together in this uh, first as local area networks and now as this wondrous internet that we all enjoy. So this is a great opportunity, and this is the way I put it. It's time to reconceive the very idea of money, currency, and payment, and realize the full potential of community currencies and direct credit clearing between producers of real value. And that is the future that I'm hoping to help create. Bravo, Tom. This was really a very enlightening and a fantastic way to make a, what is a technical, obviously a very technical subject, uh, accessible to everyone. I've learned a lot from it. So thank you very much. If I understand it correctly, that one of the major issues uh, in fiat money is the issue of control, who control the issuing of credit. Uh, and it seems to me that in the financial system that we operate today, one of the uh, a, a different but equally critical issue is the question of valuation. What is it that we value in the accounting system? Because this is the framework that allows all the externalities not to be taken into account. Uh, do you see a connection between the two? Oh, obviously, there is, like in the solar dollars. Uh, and how would you enhance that connection? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Michael. <clears throat> and that's one that I address in my book, The End of Money and the Future of Civilization, and basically all of my other books as well. Uh, you know, we have to make a distinction between the medium of exchange and the measure of value. The currency cannot measure its own value. Credit must be denominated in some uh, in some measure, in some uh, some way of uh, expressing value. And that has to be something real. Well, it used to be uh, some basic commodity like gold or silver. Uh, most people don't know this, but when the United States uh, was founded uh, and the United States dollar was created, it was defined in terms of a specified weight of silver. Mm -hmm. The U.S. dollar was to be 371 and one quarter grains of fine silver. That was the original definition. And later it was changed to a specified weight of gold. So, yeah, currency is ultimately credit, and it has to be denominated in something real. Uh, we could go back to a gold-denominated or silver-denominated currency, uh, and that would be superior to uh, the dollars and the pounds and the marks, or not marks, but euros that we have today, none of them is defined in terms of anything real. And uh, so they're, they're defined in terms of each other, which is, you know, basically counterfeit money of one type uh, defining counterfeit money of another type. So yeah, in the, uh, in the new money system, we have to define our credit units in terms of something real. Now, I've suggested that we could go back to a silver unit or a gold unit, but uh, better in this day and age when we have tremendous uh, information technologies and data gathering technologies and computing technologies, uh, we could use a market basket of mm. several commodities to define a unit of account to define our credit uh, currencies. And uh, I've outlined that in the appendix of my book, The End of Money. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And until the next time, take care and be well. And thank you all.